For this episode of Coffee with Closers, I'm sitting down with Fred Valles, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, author, and leading influencer in pay-per-click search marketing. One of Google's first 500 employees, Fred quickly established a reputation as a pioneer in PPC marketing as company's first AdWords evangelist. Today, he serves as the co-founding CEO of Optimizer, leading in multi-award-winning PPC management software. Stay tuned for my conversation with Fred Ferry, where he shares practical advice for marketers and senior leaders on how to leverage paid media as a means to drive new business. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Fred, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. Hey, Samuel, good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Most certainly. Well, I've known you for a very, very long time. And I think the first time I met you was way back in the day. It's probably like 2006 or 2007. Uh, you came to Chicago as a spokesperson for Google, traveling the world, essentially teaching people about Google Ads and Google AdWords and things of that nature. Somehow you transitioned into an entrepreneur. Now you run a, a SaaS company that helps businesses and agencies uh, optimize and run their paid campaigns more efficiently. So can you share with our audience a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey, how you went from being the first 500 and one of the first 500 employees at Google to now running your own uh, SaaS platform? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was uh, sort of born an entrepreneur. <clears throat> My grandpa was an entrepreneur in Belgium, so uh, he started a trucking company that dealt with customs clearance, which back in the day was like a thing that was very necessary. Um, and I always really was admired him and was inspired by him and wanted to make my own money somehow. And so as a kid, I uh, did anything. I got my first camera. I started taking photos and I made these custom photo note cards. Um, I would go knock on stores doors and I'd be like, hey, do you guys want to sell these? Um, I created a little newspaper, a family newspaper, and I actually raised a, I raised an IPO round for that. Uh, I was all family, like putting in a dollar here, a dollar there as, you know, a six-year-old. But yeah, that, that, that always inspired me. And then um, I moved to the Silicon Valley when I was 15. And for me, that was such a transitional um, or foundational piece of who I was coming home to where all the technologies invented and being amongst the entrepreneurs and uh, just a very different mentality than in many European countries where, you know, you're supposed to do everything kind of by the book and follow the rules that everybody has. And then you come here to Silicon Valley and it's like, there are no rules, the rules. Like, invent the next <laughs> thing. Um, so yeah, coming here, that was hugely inspirational. And then I was really lucky that I was able to join Google, um, was their pre IPO that set me up with a little bit of cash so that I could take a little bit more risk. Um, and then eventually I, you know, found PPC. I love PPC and started Optimizer, which is a PPC management company. Awesome. So it's been a, quite a journey. And you've seen a whole lot of ch uh, changes happen in, in your career for sure. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, uh, you know, driving down the freeway here 101 in the Bay Area. We used to drive past the Excite building and we'd see the Yahoo buildings and there was yeah. the tandem Both computers and then HP and Compaq and like everything. Now there's the spaceship right next to the freeway. Um, so, but, but it's sort of the core of it is always the same, right? It's technology, technology, technology. It's just who are the big players nowadays. It's really fascinating. It's definitely. So obviously you've accomplished a lot in your career. You published two books. Uh, I've seen you on multiple stages. Um, uh, every, every digital marketing conferences that I've been to, you at least had one, one session that you were speaking at. Uh, and you've, you know, you've, uh, like I said, right, you've started at Google very early days. You started an entrepreneurial journey started this tech company, doing all these different things. Um, of all the things you've accomplished, what's the one thing that you're super proud of? Well, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll say right now, running Optimizer and giving uh, a decent number of people jobs and careers and helping them grow in a field that I think is really exciting. I think that's probably one of the more meaningful accomplishments. I also think the customers that we have at Optimizer, my hope is that I make their lives easier and by making their lives easier, hopefully they have more time to, you know, some, some people might spend it on new businesses, building their career. But my hope is that it also gives them time to just be with family and have a proper weekend and like take a break sometimes and, and still know that they're doing great things for the accounts that they manage. 
Um, if we're doing mm -hmm. that, then I think that's a very meaningful achievement in how I've been spending mm -hmm. my time. That's awesome. And obviously, like I said, right, you you just keep going. You just recently, a couple of weeks ago, you published this new book called Unleveling the Playing Field. Uh, prior to that, you published Digital Marketing in the AI World. And yeah, there you go. Uh, and then, yeah, someone, you guys should get it on Amazon. It's on Amazon now. Uh, and you write on almost all the, you know, like the Search Engine Journal, all these different publications. You always have some sort of a column where you're talking about what's happening in the industry. So you find time for all of this. Um, what's your why? What motivates you and what gives you the drive? I mean, and maybe it's a bit of the origin story of how I became the ads evangelist. And back then it was, of course, called the AdWords evangelist. And as an evangelist, you do the writing, you do the public speaking. You're basically kind of this hybrid between a technologist and a marketer. Um, but it, it was just, I mean, I was working at Google. I started running my own ads accounts while I was working on the ads team. And management from Google would come to me and say, hey, we've got this conference or we got these people. Somebody needs to talk to them. Sure, the managers, the VPs, they can all give the spiel, right? They can go up on stage and do the, the marketing pitch. But they were all afraid mm -hmm. of, okay, but what happens when the questions come, right? And now people want to know like, wow, well, what's going on with broad match keywords? Or why is this bid management type working that way? <clears throat> and that's where anything that goes off script, they just didn't want to do it. And they were like, Fred, you look like you would be able to answer those questions because not only do you work at Google, but you also run a pretty successful ads account. And so I jumped at the opportunity <clears throat> and then I was like, yeah, I love the, the travel that comes with this. I love the freedom, not constantly being in the office. And then over time, I started to really enjoy the influence that came with it. You know, people would seek me out and want to know what I thought about how something was working. And, and then what's really mm -hmm. fascinating is that, you know, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I do like to listen to people. And so if you're out there and you're absorbing what's going on in the industry and what issues people are facing, you, you can sort of put the pieces together and now you become that smarter person because you've got more inputs, right? It's not about your own intelligence. It's about the inputs that you take and how you listen to other people. Um, and mm. I've really enjoyed that. And so even today, then I, ha I have great interactions with people from Google. I've got great interactions with advertisers and sort of hearing how they talk about one thing, but from different angles and how me in the middle, I can like fix that problem. I can make their lives easier. Um, that really motivates me. So, uh, so that's why I do it. And that's why I find the time for it. But, but honestly, I mean, I love travel. I love writing. Um, when I was a little kid, besides wanting to be an entrepreneur, I always kind of wanted to be a journalist or like a national geographic photographer, the, the national geographic photographer. That was because I wanted to travel to cool places and the journalist. Um, I mean, something in me just wanted to be on top of the current trends and then explain those. And I think that's a lot of what I do in my job, right? I'm not a journalist per se, but like you said, I write for search engine land, search engine journal. Um, and it is really about taking what are these things happening with the ad engines and, and how does that fit into your lives and what should you know, what should you do about it? Mm. It's kind of crazy, right? How your passion still kind of follows you, even though you're writing about digital marketing and <laughs> AI. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of crazy. So let's talk about that, right? Because obviously in the last 15 plus years you've been in this space, there's been a whole lot of drastic changes happen. From from your perspective, what, what were some of the biggest changes that you see take place in the last 15 years, and especially on the search side? Yeah. Uh, so in my early days at Google, I was involved in the acquisition of Urchin, which then became Google Analytics. That was, a, of course, a, a huge shift from Google being super focused on clicks and impressions to hey, we should also worry about what happens with those clicks after they come to your site. When does it turn into a conversion? And if it doesn't turn into a conversion, can we help you understand why? Is it something about your website that you can fix? Um, right, so that was one movement. And then as more and more data came into the ecosystem and as computers kept getting faster and machine learning got more sophisticated, you took huge amounts of data, huge computing power, and Google put those two together. And now so much of what we used to do manually as PPC practitioners has really become automated. Um, mm -hmm. It was all the way back in, I think, 2017 that I was like, what, what's going to happen, right? I, I run a company, it's Optimizer. Is that company going to be irrelevant in one year because there's all this automation? And then I work with these thousands of 
advertisers and agencies, like what's going to happen to them? Like, let me, let me think about this. Um, and I came up with some ideas on, you know, humans plus machines being better together. Um, and that's obviously not my idea, but how does that apply in the PPC world? Like what can the humans do to make the machines be better? Um, and so that turned into a bunch of blog posts and then that turned into the book. And uh, uh, I was really fascinated by, by that story. And I, I think that's really the biggest change is that move towards automation and, and what that means for the human role in the PPC world. Yeah, it seems like you have some, you know, some uh, strong opinion about that concept, right? So that's, that's why you have this most recent book that came out about the un unleveling the playing field. And I think it is definitely a mind shift because at the end of the day, most, you know, most, uh, I, I think most advertisers are trying to manage many of those things that are tedious tasks, right? Ad adjusting the bids, adjusting the budget and, um, you know, adjusting the schedule, uh, or even pausing certain certain keywords um, or turning on certain keywords that are performing best or shifting budget to a certain campaign that performs outperforms other ones. I mean, all of those are human decisions that you have to make that could technically be automated, right? And then there are other decisions that you can't make machine to do. So can you speak to that a little bit more in terms of where do you feel AI has a much better chance of, you know, per outperforming what human can do and where do you have humans, uh, where, where you believe the human intervention is almost always going to be required. Yeah. I mean, the machine is obviously much better <clears throat> at picking up on signals within huge amounts of data and, and Google has huge amounts of data. So if you go in as an advertiser and you say, Hey, I'm going to set device bid adjustments. Well, great. You can probably figure that out, but Google has much more data um, and they have data about your competitors and other people in your industry. So even if your data is really good, Google's still going to have a broader view of what uh, what's out there. Google also obviously has the they're the only company in the world that can set real time bids at the time of the auction. Um, so that's why it's so important to seed control over some of those things to Google, even if you think you can do it pretty well. Now computers better at these, uh, you know, the big math and finding that signal. <clears throat> I think the humans. Ultimately, I mean, so I equated to three roles. There's the, the PPC doctor, the PPC pilot, and the PPC teacher. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it in those roles, we, we really understand, I think, why a pilot sits in the plane. Like nowadays, mm -hmm. they only fly a plane on average 11 minutes per flight. Mm -hmm. Most of the time is just to be there in case something goes wrong and to make sure that the inputs into the autopilot are correct, right? If the, if the autopilot gets incorrect inputs, then it's going to make bad decisions. As PPC pilots, we need to look at, like, is our conversion tracking set up correctly? Is it reporting correct data? Because that's what enables the machine to steer the campaign in the right direction. Now, if you find that it's broken, you become the PPC doctor. You have to figure out, hey, well, you know, we, uh, we set up a, a smart shopping campaign. And that smart shopping campaign, all of a sudden, it's not working that well. What do we do? Okay, we got to get hands on. We got to go fix this. And so as the PPC doctor, you might look at, do we go for a regular shopping campaign? And if we go for a regular shopping campaign, which of the seven or nine different bidding types are we going to use? Mm -hmm. um, or, or are we going to run campaigns in parallel? And so it becomes about knowing about interactions of tools and like which tool is the best for each scenario. Um, and that's the funny thing. I mean, Google Ads has become so automated that you could go in and think, well, it's a simple like push a button and turn it on. But no, it's not turn, push a button and turn it on. Like you have to choose from a multitude of campaign types and a multitude of automated bidding types. And how you make those decisions is actually going to affect what comes out of it. So, uh, so it's not a simple decision. And then the final one is the PPC teacher, right? It's, it's called machine learning. Learning implies that someone has to teach it. Uh, now, Google is doing most of that teaching, but what we bring as business owners is an understanding of what impacts our business that Google may not be looking at. Uh, and my favorite example from ever was looking at the lunar cycle. Uh, and when I worked at Google, we actually looked at the lunar cycle and we said, does the lunar cycle have any impact on click-through behavior for people? Um, because that could influence quality score, a uh, project that I worked on. And so... We looked at the data and we said, no, actually, there is no correlation. There's no strong correlation between lunar cycle and click-through rates. So we're not going to use that in the system. But if you work in a maternity ward or if you are a psychic 
those are actually two industries that do are, that are impacted by lunar cycles. And don't ask mm. me why, but there's more babies born during certain phases of the moon. That's mm -hmm. just how it goes, right? So if you know that that impacts your business, the number of people coming into your location, um, and obviously as a maternity ward, you're probably not advertising at the moment that you're going to give mm -hmm. birth. But, but the point is, there's some externality that Google doesn't look at that impacts your business. You should feed that back into the system in some manner. You should be the teacher to tell the system, hey, well, in general, you may not think this is a big deal, but to my industry, my business, this matters. And so maybe I want to change my budget for those dates, or I want to change my target return on ad spend for those dates, or I want to pause campaigns because maybe I know that I'm just not going to sell much for that period of time. right? And so that makes me uh, a better advertiser. And that's what Unlevel the Playing Field was about. It's like this fear that once everybody's using the same automations, and Google's doing the bid adjustments and the device adjustments and, and geo adjustments. If everyone has that same technology, like what sets me apart from everyone else? And so it's playing these three human roles, uh, plus one additional thing, which is automation layering, that mm -hmm. does tip the field back into your favor. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that's a great way to actually look at um, in, with what hat you come into this PPC pro project or a problem, right? So I'm just here as an autopilot, just making sure that it is running okay and I've entered all the, the right destination and the coordinates and that it just does its job or, or am I kind of, now I have to do some surgical, you know, <laughs> assessment to figure out what the heck is wrong with it. Exactly. Um, that's a great analogy. So obviously, you know, one of the things you, you talked about how, you know, Google has learned and evolved and, and it does its own, um, you know, bidding and real-time bidding, all of those things which also kind of creates um, some complexity to the whole, whole thing we're talking about, right? Why you need those different roles to even optimize. So it doesn't, you know, in your, from your perspective and having worked with, you know, both B2C and B2B clients, is there some sort of a budget or anything that you would say you would have to invest or a certain type of time frame that you have to run these campaigns for before you um, start making, you know, drastic changes or even calling it off as a, not, a, not a viable medium? Yeah, I mean, so... Uh... The answer in PPC is always, it depends. Uh, but let me answer that as best as I can. So I, I think it depends much more on the conversion volume rather than the budget. And of course, the two are connected, right? If you're in uh, the legal space and a click is $100 per click, well, then your conversions are going to cost a lot of money. So you're going to have to spend a lot of money to get to that minimum number of conversions. Now, generally, Google says like 15, 30 conversions per month. Uh, per conversion action is sort of what it needs to be able to learn from that. Uh, if you're going to do an experiment between two types of bidding types, then you have to double that number, right? So that both mm -hmm. your control and your experiment have roughly that volume. But what's fascinating is that that number has been progressively coming down. And there are some automation types now, like with smart shopping, that actually don't require any conversion volume. And the beauty is that Google has so much data about you know, if, if you got your keywords or you got your products, well, somebody else has probably advertised on that before. So Google can make some pretty decent assumptions about what conversion rate may be. They, they could even look at your website and figure out, like, relative to your competitors, like, is your website fast? Is it clean? Is it modern? Does it do some of the best practices? And so they can figure this out. They, they will have a pretty good prediction rate estimate to start off with. Um, of course, what really happens for your business, that's different, right? So sometimes mm -hmm. it does help to build up that conversion volume from the get-go. Now, if you're a, a super high volume, conversion volume business, never make decisions with less than seven days of data because you still get like day of week uh, impacts. And so generally, you know, feed data into the system for two to four weeks before starting to really think about automation. Uh, make sure you have 15 to 30 conversions. If you can't get to that level of conversions, there's always the concept of the micro conversion. Um, and there's also the post conversion, right? So I, I think, and this is one of the big mind shifts that has to happen in PPC, is that too many advertisers, they think about the online lead generation as the conversion. When in fact, that's not really what they want the machine to get them more of. What they, what they want is good leads, high quality leads. And so those leads in your business, you probably call them up after they fill out the form or you send them an email and then you start qualifying them and then you start to see which ones turn into customers. Mm -hmm. That's really important data. You have to somehow feed back into Google so that they can get you not just more leads of the form filling, 
but more form fills that actually lead to the desirable customers that you want. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that's kind of like one side. The, on the other side, before the form fill, you could say, hey, uh, I can't get a lot of form fills. So people looking at a specific page on my site, that kind of tends to correlate, I think, with people eventually filling out the form. So maybe let me do a micro conversion on that. Um, and that's a way to boost the system with a bit more volume, a bit more data so that they can learn more quickly. Mm-hmm. So when you talked about feeding the data back, especially I'm assuming using some sort of a CRM system data that feeds back conversion metrics or some sort of a, uh, a historical data to, to provide that insight back to Google, is that what you're referring to? Exactly. So if you look at it, it's called usually offline conversion import. Mm-hmm. Um, an offline conversion, just it's offline because it no longer happens on your website. It may happen through the CRM, through your, your Salesforce. Um, but what's fascinating too is that this actually applies equally well to e-commerce. So if somebody buys $100 worth of stuff and two weeks later they go back to your website and they say, I want to return half of that, that's also a conversion, right? That's a negative conversion. That's an adjustment of what you initially reported and all of that stuff, and then, and then even like, oh, did that customer then make another purchase, maybe from an email campaign, or they just came back organically? Um, well, that's not tied directly to the original click, but but it is a good customer you found, right? But the customer who comes back is better than the customer who didn't come back. And so you should be able to communicate that back into the system. So there's offline conversion import, there's conversion value adjustments for e-commerce, and there's conversion value rules, which is the newest thing from Google. Um, so use one of these three mm-hmm. to, uh, to really get that in place. Now, the, the other thing that's really exciting to me, so you haven't heard about this, but Google now has what they call, quote unquote, enhanced conversions. And enhanced conversions allow you to pass in something like the email address from the lead form fill and make that the unique ID. Uh, one thing that's really complicated about using a CRM to type data back into Google to the click is you have to get the, the G GCLID, the Google Click ID, and you have to put it into your CRM and then you have to persist it throughout the CRM so that by the end of the process, once that lead becomes a customer, you can tie it back to the G GCLID. Um, but why not just tie it back to the email address from the user? You already have that in the system, right? So what if that becomes the unique key? So Google, through enhanced conversions, is starting to enable uh, a much easier way to connect your CRM back to Google Ads. Yeah, and so which brings me to the attribution a, a little bit because I know we're you know we're all hearing going toward this cookie less world and privacy is becoming an extremely uh, an important consideration for all tech you know tech companies, right? So from from that perspective, uh, attribution is going to become extremely difficult. Um, in some of these instances when, you know, we don't have a cookie cookie to actually to track whoever was on the website, who clicked and what was the original source of uh, getting them to the website and whether or not that person came back and made a purchase or submitted a form. So w- what are some practical ways marketers can do more better marketing in the future when we are going to be without cookies? Right. I think the good news is if you're using Google or Facebook or Microsoft or Amazon ads or any of the big platforms, Their technology will fix this for you. So it'll be relatively transparent to you. Um, Or it'll it'll, it'll just be a switch over. They might give you new JavaScript Mm -hmm. code or something, right? But they'll handle the privacy elements and and that's going to be taken care of. I think the biggest shift is in the deprecation of Mm -hmm. third-party cookies. Um, And so this is the nefarious stuff, right? Where you install, like, say, the Facebook login widget. And that login widget then starts tracking everything you do on any website you go to. Um, Users didn't know this. This wasn't like through an actual good consent. And I'm just calling out Facebook here, but there's far worse companies that do this type of thing. Um, And and so the the whole problem is consumers don't know. They have no choice. And then they start seeing ads they didn't really want. They they were being targeted. Um, And and that's what needs to go away. And and so in that regard, Google through... um, you know, third-party cookie data, they're actually able to supplement that in other ways through first-party data that they have. And so first-party data is fine, right? If you have a first, if, if me as a customer, mm-hmm. I come to your website and I buy something, like that's a first-party relationship and, and data can exist within that system. And so as a, now that I have your email address, 
I can put you on the email list. I can reach out to you. And again, I need to get your consent, but that is a much cleaner and easier mm -hmm. to understand thing. Um, and so I think as we see third-party cookies uh, taken away, there's going to be some shifts in how the ad platforms work and their precision and accuracy in terms of targeting. Uh, but we'll still get things. And, and Google, they did Flock, right? They had a Flock proposal. Federated Learning of Cohorts is what it stands for. Um, now, that proposal has been scrapped, but that proposal had 95% accuracy compared to the previous ways of doing like uh, interest-based targeting. So, and, and it was a much more private way. Now, it didn't pass muster, and so it had to be changed. So now Google is doing like a, a topics API. But the point is Google will find a way that still has really high accuracy that supplements or replaces these uh, third-party cookie schemes. But you, mm -hmm. as the advertiser, what you should focus on is how do you build your first-party data, right? What can you know about consumers? Uh, build your own list, what they do on your site, what they buy, um, and then use that first-party data, which you own and you have permission for, to feed back into those ad systems to target the users as they do other things. Mm -hmm. So that's it. obviously the bottom of funnel, right? Getting people to bottom of funnel and converting uh, on the bottom of funnel sort of campaign is, you know, is becoming increasingly more difficult, more and more advertisers spending a lot of money there. So you have to spend more of your energy and resources on reaching people much higher in the funnel and capturing their attention, right? And create more demand for your product offering and services. Are there some practical ways that marketers can do that with search campaign and, and, and with Google ads? Yeah, well, and that's, that's a great point. I think you just got to look at the whole ecosystem and the multitude of touch points that usually consist of the consumer journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when it comes to Google, it's like, yes, go beyond the search campaign, like take advantage of a discovery campaign, take advantage of YouTube and and build that demand, build that name recognition. Um, right. And then, and then be very selective. Once the user comes into search, you can overlay that with audience-based signals as well. So now... Um, you know, if you're in a B2B, especially if you've had people interact with your B2B website content and now that person is looking for a printer, so they type printer in Google search, well, do you want to sell that printer to a consumer and sell one printer or do you want to sell a thousand printers to a corporation? That's really hard. You don't know. They type in the same thing. They typed in printer. But if you have your first party uh, data, so then you understand the audience. Now you can say, well, actually, I just want to show this content to people who've engaged with my videos or who've read certain blog posts. That's who should see. And I said content, but I meant ad, right? So this is who I want to see the ad because this is a likely buyer um, of the right type that I want. So, so that's another thing you could do. And personally, I mean, Optimizer follows this philosophy as well, but like, you know, I, I can pick up the phone and I can call every agency in the country and be like, hey, you guys need to use Optimizer uh, or every advertiser, you got to use Optimizer. But the reality is they may not be facing any pain points. They may not be ready to buy that solution. Um, but at some point, they'll have a frustration with something from Google and they'll say like, hey, uh, I wish I could have better negative placements because as, as I'm in more of these automated campaign types, like my ad is being shown in wrong places, bad places, and I don't want this. I'm paying money for something that's not resulting in, in conversions. So now they face the pain and they start doing the search and now they get like 10, 15 alternatives of who can do this for them. Well, guess who they're going to trust first? It's the person they've seen speak at a conference, the person whose book they've read, the person in the company that they've read blog posts from, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something we can all do. Just build your own brands and, and like don't be pushy all the time mm -hmm. and just legitimately help people understand what's happening. Um, and that'll build trust. That'll build a relationship so that when they are ready, when they do need some help and want to pay for it, you will be pretty high on that list. And have you seen a dynamic search campaign uh, being leveraged to drive traffic to long-form content pieces or blogs? as the first point of touch, uh, kind of similar to what you were describing, right? Getting people to recognize you as a subject matter expert, read your content, then RLS say or retargeted, you know, search ads or something like that to get them to go to a more of a bottom of funnel search strategy and get them back to converge somewhere else. Yeah, um, I mean, I love that strategy. Um, I think it's a great strategy. And, and sort of the point is, uh, where do you find like those cheaper keywords to do that? Uh, 
to drive people to content where it's not about a transaction quite yet. And, and yes, I've heard some amazing stories about gaming DSAs, gaming sort of like videos. And when I say gaming, it's basically, it's almost arbitrage. It's like there's these really cheap pockets of traffic out there um, that you can tap into. Um, I don't remember the exact technique because that's a problem, right? When people are gaming the system, Google usually closes those loopholes. Uh, but, but that's kind of the fun part of this job too, right? Is how do we push the boundaries a little bit? How do we, um, you know, as we understand these really complex systems, where do we find that advantage against our competitors? And so what you're describing, I love it, you know, use a DSA campaign and then RLSA remarket and then eventually they'll come to your bottom of the funnel yeah one of the ways that i've seen it um some of the guys are doing is the that you you talked about the google discovery ads which could just be like a thumbnail image that takes them to a blog post and then that could be a way to get them in i'm not quite sure if those cpcs are uh reasonably priced because some some of those discovery campaigns are still pretty pretty expensive um but that could be one way to get people in and i've heard a concept that's called the lowest cost per pixel, which I don't know mm -hmm. if that concept is going to be around for too long, right? Find a channel that's actually very low cost to get somebody to come to your uh, website and cookie them or, you know, install a pixel and then try to figure out how do you retarget to them um, some other platform. Exactly. Low, lowest cost per pixel. I love it. Yeah, that was a concept I heard. So obviously you you must have seen a lot of those um, those things that you're learning in the marketing side in, you know, change the way your perspective and philosophy on sales. So can you speak to that a little bit, how your philosophy on sales have evolved over the last 15 plus years uh, that you've been teaching marketing and seeing digital marketing evolve? Yeah, well, personally, I've always felt uncomfortable with sales mm -hmm. um, because I think too many people think of sales as like the car salesman stereotype for better or for worse. Um, we have a lot of car dealers that we work with. We love them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then the, the transition was somebody told me, well, Sales is, is still about being helpful, right? Like you listen to the person's problem and you try to connect that problem to a solution. Um, and, and so it's not about forcing a solution on someone. It's just about helping them understand how we as a, an organization could help solve some of the pain points that you have. And then you make an informed decision based on that, right? Um, I also have a good friend, uh, Joe Coey, who ran SalesX. And, and he explained to me that he was running these campaigns and then it was click to call and the person who would answer the phone was a receptionist and he or she was not a salesperson and they, they just did a really bad job collecting the information, being helpful to the person with their problem. And so the campaign was seeing bad results and he was like, well, you have to connect the dots together, right? It's not about running a great PPC campaign if you don't have great people who are helpful in their sales capacity. So you have to put those two together. Um, and, and Google was always like the, the reason Google became so successful was thanks to the fact that ads on Google are not salesy. They're helpful. They're people typed in what they need and the ad answers the question. But yeah, the ad is still selling. Um, and that's sort of the mind shift. If you can bring that to your sales organization as well, like how do you become helpful as opposed to like who's got the biggest uh, huge discount side and the loudest yells the loudest. Uh, I think that's how to think about sales. Um, and so I've gotten more comfortable as I've transitioned about how I think about sales to actually having a sales team within my company. Um, so we are growing that now because um, it's sometimes frustrating, right? Like we, we talk, I talk to people at conferences and they express frustrations and I'm like, but we could have solved that for you a year ago. <laughs> like, why didn't we talk to you? Like, why didn't we connect? Um, right? Because it would have helped me, but it would have also helped them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the problem that you described in terms of uh, companies that actually don't have a good way of, uh, you know, fielding those calls that are coming as inbound and really being able to qualify those prospects and then hand it to the right people. We've seen that happen and we've caught a lot in terms of operational inefficiencies that organizations have using call recording as a way to do it. Because we've shown them, hey, you had four rings or five rings before you picked up the phone. Then after they pick, they say, hey, I got to get Fred on the phone. Let me put you on hold. But you didn't even ask, hey, what are you calling about? Can I get your number? You know, get at least some basic information about the prospect or contact before you transfer to Fred. And by the time you transfer to Fred, there goes another three more rings or whatever the number of seconds of wait. They hung up and they went to the next guy on Google Ads. 
there it goes. You just wasted your 150 bucks exactly. to get that call and you didn't do anything with it. And then who gets to blame, right? It's the agency the that agency. drove the PPC ad. It's like, well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, Google we did our job. We gave you the qualified lead. You just didn't know what to do with it. Exactly. That's a that's an operational problem. So obviously, you know, as a as an entrepreneur, you know, founder, you know, probably even a product lead, right? Giving vision for the product and all those things. Execution, getting things done is probably one of your big thing, right? In your in your uh, list of things to do. So are there any sort of framework that you follow to get things done? Yeah, um, I mean, from an engineering perspective, this is less so the case at the company today. But one thing that really worked well for me was as we're building solutions in PPC, uh, it can be really difficult to get a non-PPC expert engineer to build the right solution, um, right? Or you have to spec out everything in, in tremendous detail. But the funniest example I have about this actually is not PPC related, but we built uh, an app for pickup basketball leagues to be able to keep score. And so I had a team out of India build the app to track the score on the phone. And uh, there was a button for a free throw that was made and a button for like a two pointer and a three pointer. And when somebody clicked the button for the, the free throw, they assigned two points in basketball. I was like, well, no, this it's one point. A free throw is worth one point. Um, and so the problem is my engineers in India, they didn't play basketball, so they didn't know how the system worked. Um, in PPC, which is even more complex than basketball, that can be a bigger problem. So the way that I got things done in the beginning, especially, was I would just write an AdWord script myself. And it wouldn't be the cleanest code, but it worked and it explained the concept. Mm -hmm. And then some customers would use it and then they would like it and give some feedback. So we'd iterate and then eventually we'd say, OK, now we need to turn this into an API based tool, which is more scalable, more reliable. It's got a nicer graphical user interface. Um, but my engineering team now could look at this, the code that I'd built in scripts and understand the nuances and kind of like port it over to the new system, um, right? So, the, and that's one way of communicating. So I was communicating through pre-written code, uh, but then in other scenarios, you just have to really know how to communicate through a PRD, product requirements document. Um, that helps you get things done. Personally, for me, in my work life, I've got one of these... Uh, you know, silly pieces of paper, but it's basically what are my must do's, top three, if I get to it, fill that out once a week usually. Um, and then at the end of the week, hopefully I've got everything scratched out, which means I've done what I needed to do for the week. Uh, productivity wise, I use a paper calendar for tracking which events I speak at, which podcasts I have, because, um, you know, my my Google calendar is so booked up and there's so many things on it. It's really hard to see what is that like, what requires mm -hmm. me to have like a block of time where I can just dedicate it to not be interrupted for a podcast or where I'm actually going to be out of town. Um, so that's all on paper. Um, so mm -hmm. those are two tricks that I use. Awesome. Well, obviously, you know, one final question that I have is knowing what you know today, what advice would you, what advice would you give a younger self? Um, I mean, I think people, people are everything. Um, I had an entrepreneurial stint as a, a house painting company while I was in college and I hired the cheapest labor possible and I had the most problems ever, uh, mm -hmm. because people were not motivated. They were not rewarded. They, so I, I had to fix everything. Um, then in optimizer, I have two amazing co-founders. Uh, we each have our own expertise work really well together and that makes things very smooth um, and then bringing in the right people on the team as well right so it's it's really going for quality uh, mm -hmm. quality first because that just you can communicate to them you can communicate goals and visions and they just pick up on it they can carry it um, and not everything has to be micromanaged uh, now other people are maybe more micromanagers so that may not work for them i tend to be relatively hands-off like to set the vision the strategy um, and then be able to trust that the team is going to come back and deliver something good um, that we can iterate on. That's the dream for any entrepreneur, right? Surrounded by a team of people who just takes your vision and then go execute it <laughs> with you, giving very, dream, very minimal uh, direction. That's the thing. It is possible. And the, the other thing maybe, um, you know, something I'm starting to understand more is optimizer, um, manages a lot of ad spend, 
probably more ad spend than almost any other software tool for PPC in the world. But we don't have the highest revenue of anyone. And part of that is that we haven't made business decisions that make us highly dependent on ad platforms, for example. Um, we also haven't taken VC funding. And both of those things mean that we as the founders, we as the company, we control our destiny and we make the decisions that we think are right for our customers, for the growth of our company, for the well-being of our employees. Um, and that's a good position to be in because once you become beholden to large revenue from a, you know someone who funds you like the ad engine or you become beholden to the VC company that invested a lot of money on, in you, uh, they really call the shots and those aren't always the shots that you as the business owner who really understands the space we're in would make. Um, and that often leads companies to fail. So um, I think that's another lesson is it, it's okay not to be a unicorn to have a billion dollar valuation. You can run a very healthy, successful business and have a positive impact on a lot of lives, both employees and customers, uh, just by running a solid old school business, if you will. Awesome. Well, thank you, Fred. I appreciate your time. And, and thanks for sharing some of your wisdom and knowledge about the entrepreneurial journey, as well as about the digital marketing and uh, the world that we live in today. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Emil. Thank you. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.